Okay, hi. Welcome to the Extra Life 25 hour Gameathon. Uh, if you haven't already made a donation, please do. We really appreciate it. My name is Daryl Higa, and I'm one of the designers here at uh, Wargaming Chicago, Baltimore. And today I'm going to talk about something that's sort of a personal passion of mine, which is war games. I know, confusing. Wargaming, war games. But to give you an idea, uh, you know, Victor Keesley, the founder of Wargaming, is really, really into war games. That's why he named the company that. So it's very much a part of our, our company culture. And, but today, what I'm going to talk about, because we're talking about you know, 25 hours of gaming and everything else, I thought I'd step back and visit a topic that I just touched on really briefly, uh, if, if some of you saw my uh, Cantini presentation, which is on sort of traditional war games. And the reason why I bring them up is that wargaming uh, is kind of an interesting thing in that computer war games have kind of supplanted the old board game uh, type war games. But really, the kind of uh, a lot of the things that we talk about, you know, especially when we start talking about strategy, operations, and tactics, really trace their roots in terms of even what we do in computer games, trace their roots back to board gaming. And I still like them, so I just thought I'd talk about them a little bit. First of all, I have to say that Yes, there's been a real resurgence of board gaming. So for me to talk about these board games as somehow uh, being either passé or being dead is, is absolutely not true. The board gaming industry itself is doing really, really well and is experiencing somewhat of a renaissance. However, I'd like to point out that like, for some of the games, and I, I have them off to the side just to avoid confusion, you know, uh, games that we're talking about, like, for instance, in 2018, games like Root, or uh, like uh, games like Photosynthesis, or even um, a game like uh, here, like My Little Scythe, which is basically a, uh, a kind of abridged version of Scythe, which is also a great game. Um, these are very, very popular right now, but I, I contend that they're a little bit different from traditional wargaming in the fact that they are deeply rooted in strategy. And, and a game like Root, despite its appearances, is actually very much sort of a war game, but it's themed differently and the rules play differently. I think when we think of traditional war gaming, what we're usually thinking of is a game that sort of tries to simulate military conflict. And um, it doesn't always have to be historical, as I'll kind of cover all of these topics, but it's always an interesting kind of uh, hybrid. And it's, it's a genre that I think is still around. Uh, there are conventions for it. I've gone to I go to a few conventions that where wargaming is still sort of at the forefront of it, but it's certainly a genre that has uh, kind of moved, a lot of the hobbyists have moved into sort of the computer gaming field. But that's fine, um, and it's still very, very interesting. So I think we'll talk about both, I'll, I'll, but I do want to focus primarily on sort of uh, what they call paper and pencil or like physical board games, uh, war games. Uh, before any of that, though, I'm going to give my typical start off with sort of an introduction into sort of what, uh, there are different levels of gameplay. And I think it's, it's useful to look at games in a sort of a systematic way. And so first of all, like separating out board games that have strategy elements to it, to actual like war games, or games that are portraying war or warfare in some sort. And um, so that's the first delineation that I would make. Um, and you know, if you think about war games and abstracted war games and literal war games. I think that's the other distinction to make. For instance, two of the most classic strategy war games are chess and Go, for instance, right? Uh, Go was actually deliberately meant to be a um, sort of a test and training in how to think strategically in terms of encircling enemy forces, capturing territory and, and everything else. And chess, of course, is like, how do I use my, um, uh, my units effectively, especially if they have different strengths and weaknesses? And so these two games, are, of course, are considered classic war games, but they're very, very abstract, uh, abstracted. And then you have games where you are literally moving around military units, and those are sort of what I would consider to be more literal war games. The next thing is sort of like, at what scale does the game cover? And normally you'd think scale is just a matter of, is something of a bigger scope or a smaller scope. But I would actually argue that these are three different types of thinking. And 
This is some, something that I talk about all the time when I talk about the difference between tactics, operations, and strategy. And that applies in terms of military planning, it implies in terms of like World of Tanks, and it also applies in terms of wargaming. And there's three different categories of war games that sort of fit into this field. So at the very, and, and again, I use a hierarchy, and the hierarchy is not there to, in, to indicate something is better, but it's a, a different scale. Typically, what we think of at the very top is strategy or grand strategy. And when we talk about grand, a strategy or grand strategy, usually you're making choices about, uh, l let's say that these are traditional war games and historical war games. You're talking about the kind of high-level decisions that a nation makes in terms of its allocation of resources. Does it pursue economic strength? Does it pursue military strength? Does it pursue diplomatic strength, for instance, right? These are, these are all different things, and these are all different choices that are made. And that's considered at the strategic level, okay? And then uh, the level below that is the operational level. So let's say that you've already made these strategic decisions. You've decided what kind of forces you're going to build and in what numbers you're going to build them. Um, now you make a sort of a decision of how do I employ these forces you know, on the battlefield. And that's usually the operational level of decision making. And so these are now uh, uh, sort of, how do I move large forces around? Where do I move them around? You know, where do I fight my enemy? Where do I not fight my enemy? So that's, that's kind of the decisions you're making, uh, where the engagement might be. The final level is sort of the tactical level. And at the tactical level, this is the level that we are most familiar with in most games, and especially computer games, is the idea of, I am now in the battlefield. The location of the battlefield has been determined. Now I have to decide where, where my units are going to be. So if you're playing World of Tanks, where is my tank? Which direction am I facing, right? So these are tactical decisions or field craft decisions. And you'll find that games... There are games in all three levels and all three categories of, of thinking, and the type of thinking and decision making you have to make are very, very different in these three levels. Uh, so, first of all, what are some examples of strategic games, right? And so, I'm focusing a lot on games in the, from the 80s and 90s, and there's sort of a historical reason for that, and largely it's because that was sort of the heyday of when these games came out. Uh, computer gaming still hadn't quite caught up technology-wise. It was very, very difficult to implement a lot of these games on the computer. And of course, the proliferation of computers had only just started. So while there were definitely a lot of great computer games that sort of deal with this, which I, I will talk about later, um, really that field is dominated by uh, board games. And, I think the classic one that everyone thinks of, and I would consider sort of the introduction to all this kind of gaming, is Risk. Where basically you're, you're moving around large army, armies and there's an actual map, and so it, you know, it maps to the real world and, and the idea is that I'm moving my armies around and I'm trying to uh, take over the world. And, uh, and that's a classic level of strategic thinking because you're making very broad level decisions about where everything, uh, about, about what you build and, and how you employ them. Now again, the interesting thing about a lot of these games is that they may bleed from one category to another. So arguably Risk has operational elements and strategic elements. But again, you know, uh, I, I think that that's fine. There, there are two different types of thinking going on. Um, from um, Axis and Al, I mean from, uh, uh, um, from Risk, the next game that I think everyone sort of gains experience in this type of wargaming is Axis and Allies. And uh, not to give a hint as to how old I am, Axis and Allies, I think everyone thinks of the Milton Bradley version with all the little plastic figures. Great game, by the way. Um, believe it or not, if you go back a couple decades, there's actually a paper version of that where you're moving around little counters, more like a traditional kind of old style war game. And Axis and Allies actually existed in that form. Uh, so it, it's been around for a long time. And that was before it was um, Milton Bradley. Um, so the, uh, it, I don't remember the company anymore, but it was actually owned by a company prior to being part of that whole Milton Bradley uh, sort of release of it. And uh, that's a game where you started thinking, 
a little bit more, uh, instead of the broad strokes of risk, there was ideas of, you know, attack and defense and different types of units. And um, there's a little bit more differentiation of how the units work. And there's a little bit more uh, concern about the actual ebb and flow of, of war. Uh, from that, I think one of my favorite sort of strategy or grand strategy games that came out of that period is what a lot of people consider to be sort of a, a modern version of either risk or of Axis and Allies, and that was a game called Supremacy. Um, it, uh, the, the company that made that game actually only made two games. They were a fairly small company. I think they were run out of some guy's home. I, I, I don't have a lot of details about the, the company at the time. I was pretty young. Uh, but this, the Supremacy was basically a world domination game where you moved around armies, you moved around navies, but it was in the modern era, era so you also had ICBMs, and you also had sort of a, Star, a primitive Star Wars defense. And it was a great game. Um, it had a market forces. It had a lot of interesting things in the gameplay. Now, the standard rules that came with the very first edition uh, had some issues with it, but usually in some of the su supplementary rules and the rules that followed afterwards fixed a lot of those problems. And I spent many uh, an hour, a tense hour, playing games, um, you know, tr trying to decide the fate of the world, basically. Uh, playing supremacy, and that was really, really good at developing a keen sense of diplomatic thinking, and as well as strategic thinking. So the interesting thing that you find is that people that may excel at one area or another at the, at the strategic level may be very, very good at operational games, might actually not be so great at strategic games because that also adds the elements of uncertainty of diplomacy, it adds the uncertainty of sort of market forces, and all these other things that are typically simulated in grand strategy games. So uh, Supremacy, uh, there has been a recent remake of Supremacy. Uh, I believe I, it came out a couple years ago called Supremacy 2020. It's a different company altogether. I believe what happened is that they tried to contact the original uh, game manufacturer, but he stopped making that game uh, decades ago, and so they basically recreated the game. So it's not the exact same rules. And um, I actually tried to get a hold of this newer copy, and they said that, well, it's out of print now, even that version. The newer version is out of print, but they're planning on possibly re-releasing another game um, in the next year or two. So you keep an eye out for that. It, it's a very fun game, and it's very interesting to play a game that's sort of very risk or access and allies, but then you add in sort of the, int uh, the, the intricacies of nuclear warfare, which um, really changes things. And the thing about, uh, uh, you know, as, as you can imagine, the one thing about uh, a game that includes nuclear war means you can end the world. So you also, not only are you trying to do world domination, but you're trying to do it in such a way that doesn't um, end the world or put another player in a position to spoil, uh, to spoil the victory by ending the war. So it requires an extra level of diplomacy and it requires an extra level of thinking. And it's a really, really fascinating game. Um, more nitty gritty versions of it, and I have to be honest, I've, some, some games you read the rules and you get ready to play them, but because they take weeks or months to play, you never really get a chance to play them. Um, more specifically to the World War II era, there are more detailed strategic games. Uh, ones that come to mind are like uh, World in Flames, which is a more recent one, or the more older or more classic game, which is Third Reich. And this is clearly a game where you're thinking at the uh, strategic scale because you're trying to think of, well, what, you, uh, what types of units am I going to build? What are my priorities? in terms of economic development and, and everything else. And because of that, it's not so much about the employment of forces or where you fight, but it's like what you're fighting with. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next level down is what we consider the operational level. And, oper and again, a operational level is where, you know, uh, where you're going to engage the enemy and how you're going to engage the enemy. Um, you know, well, specifically where you're going to engage the enemy and, and with what forces are you going to engage the enemy. Uh, and for this level, uh, I thought there was a couple classics. Um, Federation and Empire, which is, a, of course, uh, science fiction by uh, Task Force Games, and that's 
loosely based on the Star Trek universe. It was originally sort of fit into the Star, uh, Star Trek universe. Uh, Federation Empire is a kind of a good example of a game that straddles operational and strategic because you make some economic decisions, but largely it's about the employment of the forces that you have. I think a good example from that era of a game that would I would consider to be operational is uh, NATO, The Next War in Europe, or something like that. This is uh, Victory Games, which I believe is also uh, no longer in business anymore. Uh, but this is a, basically a game where it was the hypothetical World War III, and this is uh, fighting basically um, uh, the, the NATO allies versus the Warsaw Pact, and uh, basically fighting over Central Europe, and, and Germany is, of course, the center of the battlefield. Uh, the interesting thing about these games, again, because we're in the modern era, not only do you have to deal with armor and infantry and the idea of rapid breakthrough, but then you have the added complications of chemical weapons, air power, and even tactical nuclear weapons. And uh, usually there are always consequences that are very negative for the use of chemical and nuclear weapons because it's an escalation. And obviously, even with the military cost, the civilian cost, collateral cost is even higher. So a lot of these games try to reflect that. And the way that, you know, uh, and now that we're kind of in the realm of the operational game, this is sort of where war games, uh, you know, like if you've ever heard the term grognard. Grognard originally meant sort of this is like a, an old soldier, and I believe it's a Napoleonic term. Uh, but grognards are, uh, grognard is often used in the wargaming hobby to refer to individuals who like to play these the, this style of gaming and it's uh, uh, and this kind of uh, sort of classic war gaming and typically what you'll see in this kind of game is that you'll see like a stack you'll see a map where everything's either in hexes or squares typically at this point so like uh, you know to give you an idea let me back up a little bit like a str strategic game uh, if you look at a typical strategic game map uh, maps are usually divided into zones and and operational areas that's the idea that you know like a small area or a large area the exact area, the physical area represented by one of these spaces is not necessarily uh, normalized or regulated because this is at the very broad level, like Eastern Front, Western Front, you know. Or, um, and so you're thinking in terms of very large, uh, very large scale. Operational level games is where you start to actually worry about distance. This is where now the distance between two cities starts to matter, and you're not just grouping those cities together as a front or an area or an area of operations, but you're now thinking about specifically, well, what roads am I going to, you know, what highways am I going to take and, and everything else? How am I going to deliver supplies from point A to point B? Um, and I guess, oh, so I should go back and talk, to talk about this, but... When we think of the strategic level, what we're talking about is moving around things at the core level or the army level. So, the, you know, in terms of military uh, sort of like um, units, these are the, the, the very largest of units, and this is the, the size of units running around. So, for instance, in supremacy, an entire nation's military might be represented by 10 or 12 pieces and for the entire military. Whereas a game like, uh, like NATO or the, there's World War II games that are also operational, you could have hundreds, if not thousands, of counters representing all these individual units. And now you're moving down to the, the division or even the company level. And uh, usually that's sort of where operational games are because that's sort of the base level, military level, that you move around and sort of as a, as, as a, um, as a functional unit. Uh, um, another example of that is... Uh, Oh, I already talked about Federation Empire. And I think there are other examples of operational games. Um, feel free to, this is pre-recorded, but feel free to make comments and, you know, and, and, you know, mention them. I, I'd really appreciate it. If I get a chance to talk about this again later on, then I'll definitely talk about it some more. Um, I think then after that, uh, then we get down to the tactical level or the fieldcraft level. And uh, tactics and fieldcraft, I think, is the area that a lot of people are the most comfortable with. It's the most tangible. It's like, if I'm in a tank, where am I placing my tank? And in board, in, in, in sort of in, in the wargaming field, there, this is, of course, also very well represented. Uh, going back to sort of the classic 80s and 90s games, and you can tell Cold War was very much on the minds of people uh, of the time. Uh, game Designers Workshop, unfortunately, another game uh, company that no longer exists, 
had a series called Assault, and this is a sort of uh, 80s and 90s uh, Central European combat, uh, again, NATO versus Warsaw Pact, and um, the kind of, uh, but now you have, count, uh, now when you think about your unit level, you're not necessarily talking about um, companies, you may be talking about actually like platoons or even individual tanks. Uh, uh, so games, for instance, like Advanced Squad Leader, that you, you may be familiar with, um, and all these other games of that level uh, sort of fit into that genre. There's actually a bunch of other board, uh, board games that you can think of that also fit into this category. Um, you know, for instance, if it's naval combat, you might control a single ship because obviously a, a single ship is a bunch of moving parts. You're talking about you know crews from 200 to 2,000 and a lot of different components. Uh, so usually, if you're talking about the ship to ship level, that's also a tactical. Uh, from science fiction, we have something like Starfleet Battles, where uh, the unit that you're moving around is an individual ship, and all the components on that ship are on a control sheet. And um, basically, you go around, and then you make a decision. You have to you have to turn your ship. The facing matters, and uh, you know, like you employ different weapons, and depending on your fireworks and everything else, and uh, sort of a game like Starfleet Battles sort of fits that tactical. Uh, a lighter version of that, and I, th I have long since lost the original boxes and counters for them, but is a, a game, a three, a three game trilogy that came out from Steve Jackson games. And it's been re-released since, so, but I'm, I, I'm talking about the original set of games, was called uh, Ogre, uh, GV, and Shockwave, or Jev or Shock and Shockwave. And this was actually a very, very seminal game for me because it really got me engaged in tactical thinking. But, you know, like in high school, um, you could get a, a quick game going in a matter of minutes and finish a game in 15, 20 minutes. And, and, but it still had all the traditional aspects of a war game. It had a tactical map that usually represents like one hex would be like, um, you know, either forest or plains or a road or a city. And then uh, each individual counter represented one unit. Uh, you know, for instance, tank, or infantry, or uh, missile tanks, or uh, GEVs, which were these hover units. And uh, the original game, which was Ogre, featured um, a single cybernetic tank that everyone else, that everything, all the other units on the board were fighting. Uh, and uh, this is akin to, if you've ever read science fiction, uh, there's a science fiction series called... Uh, about uh, uh, Bolo uh, from uh, Keith Lommer. He writes about these uh, super intelligent tanks. And as, a, as his series progresses, they start off from being like built in GM by Detroit, you know, in the beginnings of his story, all the way to self-planning and self-planning um, self strategic rob uh, basically tanks from the far future, from, you know, like, from 3000 AD or something like that. And so it's this long series of uh, short stories about self-directed tanks. And um, that became inspiration for this tactical game called Ogre, in which um, you know the tank was so large that you use nuclear weapons to just shoot small parts of the tank off. And so like each one of those tanks, each component of that tank was equivalent to a bunch of your ground forces. And so it was like a one versus many kind of game. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, because that game proved to be really, really successful, uh, it evolved into another game called GEV, or uh, Ground Effect Vehicle, which is a hovercraft, basically. And so it, it, this game became more fluid, and it was more about, um, instead of having the two, um, instead of having a behemoth tank and the other force being all these individual infantry, uh, individual units. It was about two individual units fighting, or uh, two sets of individual units fighting, or two sets of individual units fighting, uh, both speared by one of these uh, ogres or these large uh, tanks. Uh, it was a really fun game. Again, the nice thing about these games is that they're very quick to pick up and very easy to play. And um, you could play a sh very short game or you could play a very long involved game. And the nice thing about GEV is that it had a lot more terrain. The idea behind Ogre was that you're kind of fighting in this post-nuclear war uh, wasteland, so it was craters or rubble. So there wasn't much variation there. But uh, GEV sort of implies that you've expanded the game now to fight in the places that have not yet been ruined by nuclear war. 
Shockwave was then a further expansion of this where they added more units, they added more specialized units, they added cruise missiles, but it was basically more of the same thing. But that was a very interesting trilogy. Um, uh, there are some versions of it still available, um, I think, and uh, if you haven't played it, I suggest tracking it down. Uh, that gives you an idea of what sort of these traditional war games are all about. Uh, there's something called the Combat Results Table, or the CRT, and basically what this is a graph is, and this is how you ent enter the uh, random element into something. Typically what happens in a CRT in one of these traditional games is that you take the attack power of the attacker, you compare it to the defense power of the defender, and it's, it's a giant grid, you line those two up, and it tells you uh, what die roll you need to make the desired effect happen. And you know, in some games, that means a unit gets destroyed. But in a lot of games that are uh, of a bigger scale, it means, oh, the unit is either disrupted or is forced to retreat or something along those lines. And that's sort of, an, and uh, I, what I think is that Ogre, Gev, and Shockwave give you a quick introdu in introduction into all of that. Um, more advanced games, as I mentioned earlier, things like Advanced Squad Leader are far more detailed. They have a lot of extensive rules. And if you're a World War II history buff, it's, uh, it's quite an intense game because it models so many different weapons that, were, uh, that fought in World War II. It, fight, uh, it talks about different types of troops, different types of troop quality. It includes things like morale. It includes factors like has that, ex has, that unit been, uh, ex has that unit experienced combat or not, right? I think one thing I talk about all the time is that when we talk about militaries, there are huge organizations with millions of people, and Hollywood makes it seem like every one of them fought in every single battle, but that's usually not true because of fronts and everything else and support, and some units are in reserve and some units are in attack. Uh, the amount of exposure to combat that different units have can vary quite a bit, and that has an effect on their troop quality, at least in the first fight. Usually what happens is that once they've had their first fight, they've kind of been exposed to that combat, and then, um, depending on the level of experience, determines like their troop quality. And all of these factors are kind of modeled in Advanced Squad Leader. And again, squ Advanced Squad Leader is, again, what I would consider a tactical level game, because you're now concerned about where my individual machine gun nest is. Um, you know, my, the introductory game that I had that my friend gave me what is a classic example where I was a um, Soviet, was that a motor rifle or infantry? I think I was just a, a, a Soviet infantry unit and my friend was a, um, a German uh, machine gun unit and we were fighting in the uh, ruins of uh, Stalingrad, to give you an idea. And so now this, it mattered like, did I have an MG42? Or uh, did he have an MG42 or did he have an MG34? What was the facing? What direction was the, was the crew facing? You know, was this a veteran unit or not? Um, you know, w was I equipped with different, you know, like, I, I don't remember. I, I, it was still standard, so it was like most of the guns. It, it was so long ago, but I think it was like, you know, do I have any special weapons? Do I have things like flamethrowers? Do I have things like um, uh, special, like rifle grenades and things like that? And so it takes all of those things into account, and it's a pretty interesting way to play. And of course, Again, you're thinking at a different level from, let's say, a first-person shooter where you're really kind of only worried about where am I placed as to start thinking about where are all the different units placed. And um, you're much more concerned about like moving forces around on, on a map and securing a front and then securing a flank and you know, trying to outmaneuver the enemy and everything else. So it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, let's see now. I think... That covers a lot of where these are. Now, I will say that, there is, uh, again, the recent trend in games has been, it's not that they're not strategic, but the theme, the theme of the games is very, very different. Uh, for instance, Root, as an example, the theme is much more about um, sort of a forest and all these different creatures fighting over the forest and everything else. Or um, a, a game like My, My Little Scythe, which is kind of like the original game. It's sort of like Scythe, which has a more historical premise, but it's actually kind of based, also based on My Little Pony, which is an interesting little bit of trivia. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, we're, there are some games that are, have adopted sort of the modern gameplay style. And the, so modern games, I guess the best way to put it is that modern games still involve a lot of strategy. Uh, you know, there's the Euro gaming camp, and then there's sort of like the 
uh, sort of like the rule-based kind of um, camp. And you have a lot of gaming. Uh, so it's not that these games don't involve a lot of thinking and a lot of strategy and a lot of planning out. Uh, that being said, uh, thematically, a lot of them have moved away from the direct military theme or specifically historical war themes. And they've kind of taken a different approach. However, you do you can find games that are specifically themed as war games. Um, uh, if you've ever played the game Dominion, which is basically a deck building game, um, it, it's, a, it's a genre that I've really fallen in love with, and it's a very quirky one, because I think a lot of people, when they think of uh, card games, they think of collectible card games, like Magic. And the whole point of Magic is, of course, to assemble a deck of cards. And building that deck of cards happens before you ever sit down at the table across from your opponent. You have to plan out, you know, um, what is your ratio of land cards to, the, you know, to your heroes and all this other stuff. And that's sort of the decision that's made before you start to play the game. Uh, Dominion is an interesting game because what it basically is, is it's a deck building game. So what happens is the game, you are, instead of building the deck before you even start playing, uh, basically as you sit down at the table and play with other players, you're building your deck as you play. Um, and so this, this creates a very different and interesting uh, dynamic. First of all, uh, unlike a game like Magic, where it's literally a collectible card game, uh, so it, it doesn't matter what your actual base collection of cards are, everyone has, it's sort of a level playing field. The, the deck that you buy for this game is all you need. You don't, I mean, you can buy expansions for it, obviously, but everyone is playing with the same deck of cards. So th that's one aspect to it. And th the second aspect is, of this is that you are now reacting to the circumstances that are happening in the game and what other players are doing as you're building your deck. So you can adjust things as the game progresses. And so I, I find this very interesting. Um, and so there's a, a Japanese game, actually. Haha, <laughs> see? Something Japanese came up, right? Um, there's a company named Arclight, and they made a series of, um, they made two games. I have another one here, but I'm propping this map up on it, um, called Barbarossa and El Alamin. And these are basically uh, deck building games akin to Dominion, but a lot more sophisticated in terms of uh, the actual gameplay element, because Dominion was about accumulating points. Um, uh, this is more about the fact that all the players, in, in, in both cases, um, you're a uh, Axis commander, specifically a German commander, and um, you're either fighting on the Eastern Front or you're fighting in North Africa. And in, in Barbarossa, you're fighting uh, against the Soviet Union. And so um, basically, all of the players are fighting against, uh, you might, I, I guess, it's, this is kind of bled over from computer gaming side, an artificial intelligence, or basically uh, the deck itself is the uh, uh, Soviet deck. And there's a number of cities, and these cities defend themselves, and you are trying to capture all these cities on the Eastern Front. And that's the Barbarossa game. El Alamin is North Africa, so it's now Germany and Italy, uh, so you're an Axis commander, and you're fighting against the British. Uh, this is before the entry of Americans. So, um, and uh, the interesting thing about El Alamin, so Barbarossa came out first, and it was already kind of a neat game because, you know, you have all these different military units and the different military units, like reconnaissance lets you look at decks, you know, look at the cards. And, and uh, you know, like the panzer units have a lot of firepower, but they take a lot of resources to, to use and everything else. Um, and so there's a lot of this uh, uh, um, kind of tension between the, the, the military aspect of the game and the gameplay. So I, I found that really amusing. And then El Alamin was a further refinement of that. So now... Basically, what it was is that the, the, the defense of the cities was actually handled by a set of rules that everyone is playing against. And so there's actually a deck of cards and events that actually form sort of like, like you're playing an opponent, but the opponent is the, the, the deck of cards. And it's, it's, it's actually quite a, a lot of fun. I've been getting people at the office to play this game. Um, uh, I, maybe not everyone shares their enthusiasm for this game like I do, but... Uh, uh, it's definitely a game that uh, at least me and my friends um, really enjoy. Uh, and to that point, um, I, I said that a lot of board gaming has died, and that's actually not, like I said, except for the sort of the new generation of 
board games, which is a lot more about like uh, engine uh, Euro games, which is a lot more about generating usually some kind of uh, economic engine, or uh, you know games that have been themed kind of away from the topic of war. Um, but uh, there, even war gaming itself has made a bit of a resurgence, and that's because of the online, the advent of online virtual uh, gaming. Uh, there are two uh, big programs that I use, and I know that there's a third one that's really popular in uh, CIS countries. I don't know the name of that one, unfortunately, but uh, Vassal is Vassal is an open source game, and there's a game available on Steam uh, called uh, Tabletop Simulator. And what both of these games allow you to do is over the network play war games. And the interesting thing, and it's an interesting innovation because basically what these are is that these are tools that allow you to physically, to virtually reproduce physical board games. They do not include rule enforcement. So everyone kind of sits around a virtual table and plays a game using cards or using counters and maps and everything else, but all the players still have to know the rules. Uh, but what this means is that it, it, instead of taking a long time to program one of these games, because honestly, uh, programming the AI and programming the rules are what takes a long time in converting a game from, let's say, a board uh, tabletop game into a computer game. This gives you the flexibility of with just scanning in a few things. Like, for instance, this card game. All I need to do is scan in the deck and mat it to the 3D version of a card deck, and I'm instantly playing this game now. Uh, across, with people uh, um, all over the world. In fact, tonight, I'll be going home and I'll be playing a game with, with my friends this way. One guy lives in Japan, uh, some of them live on the West Coast, I'm here in Chicago. We can all play uh, uh, games virtually that way. So it's a, great, it's a great way to play games and to experience sort of this type of gaming without physically getting together. Of course, physically getting together with your friends, sitting around, drinking beers, playing this kind of game, is still the best. That's why they call them beer and pretzel games. But that isn't necessarily always possible. And so uh, the new virtual version, especially like my friends are all over the world right now. And so um, that makes it necessary to use sort of these computer, computer assisted games, I guess. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about a little bit, and this is, uh, again, like I said, I, you know, you might say, well, why am I talking about computer games when I work for a computer game company? But I will say that uh, you know, uh, Victor Kiesley, our CEO, talks about war games all the time. It's a personal hobby of his. You, uh, you know, that's the kind of company that we work in, which is really cool. Um, there are uh, a lot of computer games, and I feel like covering the history of all the computer strategy games is really, really crazy. But I will talk about a few sort of games that kind of st stick out in my mind. Um, at the strategic level, um, there's a couple games, uh, like first of all, I liked a lot of the uh, um, SSI, uh, Strategic Simulations Incorporated. They, they no longer exist, unfortunately. I think their catalog has reverted to, I don't remember who, which company it is. I'll have to research that. If someone out there knows, please let me know because I'm not really sure. Um, uh, but um, uh, at the strategic level, I think the games that I like the most, uh, there's a game called Imperialism and Imperialism 2. These were amazing games. Um, they included um, sort of like what we think of for uh, civilization where, you know, you're building units and you're moving around on the, on the board and you're trying to capture new territories and everything else during the age of imperialism. So, again, I don't just play science fiction. I don't just play World War II. I actually do like other periods of history. And so imperialism was a great game because it was also talking about sort of that imperial period uh, f for Europe. Uh, not so good for the rest of the world, but it still makes for an interesting war game, right? Um, so uh, Imperialism and Imperialism 2 are great games. In fact, the scary thing is that game is probably 30. Oh, I, actually, I lost track. It's, it's decades and decades old. It still has an active community because players have kept that game alive. The source code has become, I guess the source code has eventually leaked out and people have actually been modding that game and still support that game, which is amazing to me. And that tells you, gives you an idea of how much of a loyal fan base it is. I haven't played it in years, honestly, but I mean, that's still like, um, it's interesting because when I do job interviews, uh, I'm not listing first person shooters. I actually like first person shooters and I actually do play a lot of first person shooters. 
but when they list list games, it's 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 RPGs and strategy games, which is always it makes for an interesting game interview in the industry because the emphasis is certainly not there. Um, another interesting game uh, is Hearts of Iron, and this has had sequels. I I really love Hearts of Iron too, from Paradox. Um, uh, they've also made uh, Hearts of Iron three and Hearts of Iron four uh, was more recently released. Um, they're the studio that also made uh, U- Europa Universalis, which is also a great series, but I think I like the Hearts of Iron series in particular because it's World War II related. Um, one interesting story about playing Hearts of Iron, this is one of those weird things where um, there was a time when I was doing military. Uh, I was working on video games for the military, and uh, uh, I found myself in Washington, D.C. I had a meeting with a bunch of... Um, uh, folks, it wasn't the Pentagon. Well, it's the Pentagon, but it wasn't at the Pentagon. This is one of the many other government uh, sort of buildings that the Army has in Washington D.C. And because of the target audience for the the simulator that I was working on was actually at the lieutenant colonel level, I was found myself having lunch with a bunch of uh, lieutenant colonels and everything else. My boss was net was trying to network with somebody who was dealing with our contract, which left me with the military guys, and I was sitting here going, man, I don't know if I'm going to have anything to talk about with these guys. So on a whim, and I had just been playing, uh, on a whim I said, said, oh, I just, I tell you, I, I had a really good Hearts of Iron game the other day. And they said, oh, really? I play too. And so I said, oh, okay, now I have something to talk about with these guys. And so I, I, I went on and was telling them a story about how I had gone through and playing as the winning uh, playing as the allies is interesting and a great way to learn the game but i find playing as the axis I, th- there's no, no political statement in this at all there's a playing as the axis is a lot more interesting because it's the deck is stacked against them really uh, in, it's very very in, in a lot of these games they try to make it more balanced so that they give a way for the axis to win but oftentimes especially hearts of iron because you it's such an open-ended game um uh, to give you an example, Hearts of Iron, you could play as Argentina. To, to give you an example, you could play World War II as Argentina. You wouldn't do much for most of the game, but it's possible. So I, that gives you an idea how flexible that system is. Um, so I, I started off playing Germany, which was, also, which was very, very interesting. Then I moved to playing Italy, which was actually a fascinating game and a lot harder than I was expecting. And after those two, I said, okay, well, I guess I'll try playing Japan. So I decided to try to play Japan, and I made the strategic decision, again, at the strategic level, that what I was going to do is that, um, uh, luckily, you know, I can ignore internal politics in this kind of strategy game, and I basically withdrew from all of our colonies in, 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 in China, and I knew that America was actually going to be my biggest threat because of their navy. So in 1937, I launched a surprise attack and took Los Angeles with my fleet. And then I sent a second fleet down to the Panama Canal and basically used the uh, Marines and aircraft carriers to seal off the Panama Canal so the Atlantic fleet couldn't get through. And I'm talking about this with these uh, lieutenant colonels and stuff, and they were just like watching me and telling me, I said, wow, this is not what I was intending when I came to this meeting, but it's working, so I kept talking. So I explained what happened and then like the the forces that I used and the problems that I had. And eventually I said, well, the ultimate punchline is I got as far as Texas and Eisenhower showed up with uh, 50 divisions of National Guard and wiped me out. (laughs) And they they all laughed and they, they were talking about their war stories and everything else. And that's the amazing thing about these types of computer games and these types of stories is that you have these shared experiences. You know, and, and again, you're telling war stories, but you're not, you know, luckily no one gets hurt, right? Uh, you know, maybe some feelings get hurt if you're not, if you don't have good sportsmanship on, when you're playing, but uh, it's, it allows you to engage in these what-if questions without, you know, and in, in, in a fun and entertaining way. And that, I think that's the whole thing about war, uh, a lot of these war games. And you'll find that I talk about this all the time, and going back to sort of World of Tanks console and everything else, when I talk about war stories and when I talk about all this other stuff, is that a lot of the what-if questions are things that we do in gaming all the time 
that maybe when we talk to people outside of that, they'd be like, what are you talking about, right? But, you know, um, I'll be honest, when I was doing historical research, um, this is exactly what uh, a lot of these guys sitting in, you know, the, the Pentagon and everything else have to worry about. You can, historically, you can find reference to all these war plans, for instance, in the, developed in the 20s, where the United States anticipated going to war with the United Kingdom, okay? In the context of what happened 20 years later, that seems utterly preposterous, but at the time, we didn't know who our enemies were, right? And you don't know who your future enemies are. And if you don't at least think about that, right, your military could be at a severe disadvantage. So war games throughout, when the first Go board was made, or when the first chess set was made, the real intent was to start thinking about these problems in a non-lethal way that allows me to at least exercise that part of my brain and ask those what-if questions. And uh, the evolution of that to the games that we have here, which was the 80s and 90s, which is you know, good 20, 30 years ago, to even what the modern war games are and everything else, has been amazing and really, really incredible. And that's been quite a journey. And that's been one of the main reasons why I kind of uh, meandered from academia into uh, game development is because of my passion for this stuff. Uh, uh, computer, computer games and uh, uh, board games first of all and then computer games afterwards became a way to express and ask these what if questions. And it, it's just a fascinating and interesting thing and that's why you play it. And, and you know, it's like, if I had been there, especially when you're playing historical games, the question always comes up, if I had made that decision differently, what would have happened? And that's what war games allow us to do. And, and you know, for science fiction games, it's sort of like, if I'm in that situation, you know, what will I do? So um, the takeaway from all this, I appreciate you guys sitting here listening to me talk about gaming. Again, we're in a 25-hour marathon about gaming, so of course, you know, I do want to talk about all kinds of games. Um, this is just a little peek into one of my, you know, uh, as, a, as a game designer and as a game fan, these are kind of uh, a genre of games that I, I really, really love. It's hard for me to judge. I'm going to guess that there's quite a few of our viewers out there that are familiar with this stuff, but I'm also going to guess that a lot of you have probably not seen a lot of these, particularly the board games. Probably the computer games are much more familiar. And notice that I haven't even gotten into real-time strategy games. Oh, you know, tactical games and operational games. Oh, I should probably back up. There are a couple more computer games that I should mention. Sorry. This is a little out of order. <laughs> Archie's laughing at me. But um, uh, operation at the operational level, you see, I, this is why I had a notepad and I completely ignored it after a while. Uh, there are a couple computer games. I, I want to talk about some of the older classic ones because if you can find them online, uh, these are really gems worth digging up. Um, Operational Art of War is a fantastic game, and that focuses on the operational level. Uh, and I mention this because operational level games are actually really hard to find. Okay, that that used to be a dominant str uh, kind of a strategy game uh, genre by a company called uh, again SSI or Strategic Simulations Incorporated, but they kind of disappeared w when um, uh, real-time strategy games appeared because. Real-time strategy games are a little bit easier to play and a lot faster. But this Operational Art of War is a different... I mean, operational thinking is a different way of thinking. Operational Art of War is a great game that kind of expresses that. There are some even older games that are sort of classic in that respect. Uh, there's a game called North Atlantic 86, so you can tell. 86 was in the future when this game was made, to give you an idea. And Reforger 88 um, uh, and uh, Mech Brigade. And these are all computer games that were basically simulating sort of operational level, actually Mech Brigade is almost tactical, but uh, these are games that kind of expressed sort of like operational level planning, uh, science, it's, they're a little bit of science fiction-y because they were projecting into the future, but it was all with a contemporary 80s uh, uh, NATO and Warsaw Pact military hardware. Um, uh, finally, uh, for computer games, again, uh, tactical level, um, luckily we've seen a resurgence of this. Uh, you know, Valkyria Chronicles, some, you know, uh, something that we, when we partnered with Sega, was one of our partners. 
A lot of people recognize those tanks, so I know that there's a lot of people out there who played Valkyria Chronicles. If you didn't catch it on the original PS3 version, it then came out on PC. And I think uh, uh, it, it, that game had a lot of problems because it came up against like Little Big Planet and f and uh, you know Fallout, and so it had it struggled in its console release. But since then, its PC release, it's been very well received. If you haven't tried it, really try it right now. Uh, uh, Basically, Valkyria Chronicles 4 is out, another great game. It's a continuation of the same storyline and, and actually the same type of gameplay that's this hybrid between a turn-based tactical and an action game, which is really, really neat. Um, you know, games like XCOM. Oh, the first time I played XCOM, I was playing for about 20... You know how you hear about people playing until they, like, pass out? And you think, who the hell would do that? Uh, my first time playing XCOM, it was such a tense game you, as you slowly discovered the conspiracy behind the game and the bigger story. My friends came by. They said, oh, he's playing XCOM. They went away. They came back 24 hours later. I was still playing. And they go, oh, when did you sleep? And I go, uh, this is the same game. They literally dragged me off the computer, took me out to took me out to, to eat, and then put me to bed. They would not let me play anymore. But... Uh, but, you know, those kind of games are also very intense, uh, sort of tactical games. And, of course, don't forget Panzer General. So uh, Panzer General had a, a series of spinoffs. Uh, Panzer General, Allied General. Um, uh, they even had a Pacific General and People's General. So that, that spawned a whole series of games. It was also an excellent tactical game. Uh, anyway, I've kind of rambled, and so I appreciate everyone for, you know, listening to all this. If you have any comments... If there's stuff you want to talk about, if there are questions you have about any of those games, please, you know, like Rybot, Rybot said, you know, I gave Rybot a list of possible topics, and she goes, oh, two more games. And I said, okay. Hopefully, so hopefully there's something interesting. She also said, drink the blue tea, which I'm not, well, so I'm drinking the blue tea, Rybot. Um, in any case, uh, hopefully uh, this was interesting to you. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, if there's anything you want me to follow up on, Please let me know. I know this wasn't specifically about World of Tanks or about tank tactics, but it was in a way. I mean, it, it really, these are the different kinds of thinking that you, that you want to exercise when you're playing a game like this. In any case, uh, thanks for watching. Talk to you later.